Right, so just yeah, a bit of an update um, where we're up to. We've got a project running from, um, from the Darling Downs, basically, all the way down into the Wimmera area and then across to the Air Peninsula. So it's quite a broad project. Fair few partners in there. So we've got um, SARDI, New South Wales DPI, GRDC, CSIRO, and working again with um, Mal Sustainable Farming and also Charles Lott University and Birchip Cropping Group who ran our site at Long Renong last year. Um, so a lot of people involved in this work. So, so far we've done, just, just on the sowing date, sowing date work has been a really big focus of it and, and then determining varietal phenology and the responses to sowing date. Um, and we've got now 30 experiments from southern Queensland across to the Air Peninsula with flowering date, flowering biomass, maturity biomass, growing yield with a hand cut and growing quality. So it's a fairly big data set that takes a fair bit of pulling together. A couple of things with it have been that we've been, um, we've been really big on managing nitrogen, so that's not a limiting factor. So a lot of the trials have got at least probably 170 kilos a hectare of nitrogen. So we've sort of found that um, that's a huge thing to make sure that we're not confounded with nitrogen deficiency. Um, and a lot, of the, in a lot of situations, not always, but sometimes we have to actually sort of force sowing by, by applying irrigation to actually get the sowing going using some, irriga using some drip irrigation systems. So I think from, I'm sort of definitely learning as I go along. So um, I think that's, that's the best thing about the project. I'd, we learn so much about canola as we go along. There's been a lot of low hanging fruit with canola because if you, if you look at sort of research literature, there's so much data and things like Tony Fisher and that sort of authors like that that have got so many papers on the physiology of wheat where canola is a lot, a lot less data actually available on that, especially public sort of data. So we've been trying to, tackle some really low hanging fruit of canola, such as say phenology drivers and physiology of canola as well. And I think one thing I've sort of found that we really need in terms of say sowing date decisions and phenology decisions, we really need to match up to the critical growth period of canola. So when is canola most sensitive to stress? So that's, um, so we try to work out experiments to actually work out is it the um, bud initi initiation stage or is it the early flowering stage or is it say the late flowering stage? What's the critical stage for canola? And then we need to match that up with the optimum flowering window. So when is the environment at its best conditions to, um, for, for canola's critical growth stage to match up with that? So when is the variety least frosty? When is there most moisture? When is there the least heat? And when is there a, um, enough solar radiation to, set, to get enough carbon capture to set enough yield potential? And a lot of those things, they'll be a compromise. And they, obviously that optimum flowering window varies from year to year. And then I suppose to get those two to match up, we need the right combination of variety and sowing date and varietal phenology, especially in sowing date, to sort of make them match. So the first one of them is that, that critical growth period. So this bit of research um, sort of shows that it doesn't necessarily matter how you limit growth. It's more about that if you do limit growth through critical growth periods, you limit yield, yield potential. So what we actually use is shading as a way to actually reduce the amount of radiation available to the crop, reduce the amount of photosynthesis, and you can apply a really abrupt stress to a crop. So we go in, we've made these shade shelters up. Um, we put them on, you can see there, probably about two to four leaf stage. It was, that was uh, late May, or early June. Um, and they go on for 100 day degrees. So at that period there, they were on for about 10 days. So those shelters would go on for 10 days and then it would move on to another treatment for the next 10 days. But 100 day degrees, so it meant that at the start it was about 10 days. As we got more into the sort of depths of winter, it was about 12 days. And as it ramped up into spring, because it got warmer, 100 day degrees was less and less, and we came in that we needed much, we only needed five days for the last period once we're into sort of mid October. So, what it did was an 85% reduction in the amount of radiation actually getting into that crop. So, it meant we could put a stress on on this date, remove it at this date, where we can't really do that with water or even say with heat or frost or anything like that. So, they were able to move up through the year, and this work has been done before in a lot of other crops, but not so much canola. So if we look here, we've got, this is from Victor Sadras that published this work. So at the, this zero point here is that we're looking at the timing of stress across here, and this zero point is flowering. So a lot of the cereals we know flowering is anthesis. The zero for canola is probably more the commencement of flowering. So that, that's sort of starting in this period and moving on here. So you can see with a lot of our broadleaf crops like peas, lupins, chickpeas, it's sort of mostly in that, from the commencement of flowering, through that sort of pet flowering period where we drop seed number with stress. Whereas with our cereals such as barley and wheat in the black and red and blue, our stress reductions are caused, our yield reductions are caused more by stress sort of occurring in that 20 days before flowering. 
And so what we call commencement of flowering is 50% of plants with one open flower. And that's all, that's all through this talk. If I'm talking about flowering dates, that's, that's a flowering date we're talking. So it's not when a crop is brilliant gold. Um, that will happen sort of a couple of weeks later, but that's, that's the easiest stage to actually measure. So when we look at that from last year where we did this experiment with the shade shelters, we found probably a similar thing to what we saw with, that, with, the, with the field peas and that sort of thing in the previous slide, that it was really in this period, so we've got 100 day degree periods along each one of these, each one of these figures here. So this is the first stage was there around that six leaf stage. And this is the unshaded, so about four and a half tonne of the hectare last year at Wagga. So virtually non-limited by anything last year. So we really we were quite lucky to get a year where, the, where there was no other factors really limiting yield because we had virtually no heat, no frost, um, no moisture stress, and it was actually on a pretty good site. They didn't get waterlogged, and we put about 300 kilos of van on to make sure that wasn't limiting as well. So about four and a half tonne of the hectare with no shading. You see, we might have dropped yield potential a little bit around that six leaf stage, which is sort of, which they do see if, if grazing goes in too early, you can limit yield potential. But generally in that vegetative phase, maybe a, a blip there, whether that's noise, but in that vegetative sort of phase, not, not a great effect on yield potential. But you can see as we hit that flowering window, if we stress the crop sort of between the start and the end of flowering, that's when we get that really big drop off in grain yield potential. And then again, not so much, maybe, a little bit of effect later on, but that, that effect sort of once flowering is finished doesn't do so much, largely because seed number is the big driver of our yield and all that seed number is obviously happening. There's no effect of seed number post-flowering, so all that is happening pre-flowering. So there's, we get pretty linear co correlations between seed number and grain yield, but generally quite flat correlations between seed weight and grain yield. So that was, there, that was 44 wide in iron, sown about the end of April, and that's, well, yeah, as I said, we're quite lucky to get that sort of the only stress we got on those treatments was shading. So that lowest yield potential last year, the seeds per square metre reduced from 130,000 to 70,000, but the grain size did increase from 3.6 to 4.5 milligrams. So in most seasons though, if we got a stress in this period, sort of early to mid flowering, it's pretty rare that we actually get pretty good conditions to recover. So that's sort of, usually we get a stress that the crop keeps on staying stressed. If you're droughted, in the middle of August, it's pretty rare you're not going to be droughted at the end of September. So you're not necessarily going to get that recovery that we saw in this. So the second thing is, if we know the critical growth period and the most sensitive period of the plant, we need to get that into the best environmental conditions. So in, obviously it's that trade-off between not flowering too early where you might get, um, maybe get frosted and the crop, even from sowing too early and flowering too early, it can sort of race into... Um, flowering and not actually produce enough biomass, not actually capture enough carbon to set up enough yield potential, then obviously flowering too late usually come into more heat stress and more moisture stress. So from APSI modelling, the, this is for Wagga, so the best, for, this is the best flowering window, so the best window to actually commence flowering. So in a decile 9 to 10 year, you can see we can sort of start flowering in the blue line here from about that sort of early August and continue to be able to really start flowering right up till the end of September. So that's what we saw last year, and, and we, we probably did see that reflected, that we saw winter varieties that were flowering very late September still yield very well at Wagga last year. But as we come down to, say, a death on a one to two year, we're more in that sort of 10th of August type start flowering window, but a really sharp drop off with late flowering. That's reflected by what we've seen probably, if you compare the modelling the, the years before 2000 compared to the years after 2000, up to 2015. So from 1996, 1966 to 2000, the Lopton flowering window, around that 10th of August. But, is, but from 2001 to 2015, it has come forward a little bit, but also it's got narrower. We can't necessarily shift the whole thing completely forward because we, get, we still get frost damage and that sort of thing too, and, the, and frost risk is actually increased in a lot of situations. But we're penalised much more now from late flowering than what we were previously. So we've got to be more and more careful over time to actually hit that critical flowering window. And it doesn't sort of matter which type of variety you plant, if it's a long season variety sown early or a quick variety sown late, provided they hit that flowering window, that's still the same rankings. Although APSIM does predict that long season varieties sown early should yield more than fast varieties sown late, provided that their flowering date is exactly the same. But I think we've found that's probably not necessarily the case, that we've got, we, but that assume, assumes that these varieties are isogenic lines, that they're, um, that a long season variety and a fast variety are exactly the same, except for their phenology. So there's a lot more differences going on in our varieties than just phenology.
So the third one is really, I've got number one there, I didn't mean to, but um, characterising the phenology. So this is from Wagga last year where we had 12 varieties sown at three sowing dates. So right from what we probably see as being one of the fastest spring varieties, diamond, up to what we've probably got as one of the slowest spring varieties, archer. So when we sowed in the green is the 31st of March so in the blue is the 13th of April so and in the red is the 29th of April sowing. So we're quite lucky that we did have enough moisture this side and the grower did sow archer on the 1st of April as well. So we actually got a, um, we got a comparison to what the grower was doing. So we got diamond, so across to the left here, these are the flowering windows. So it means at the left here, diamond started flowering on the 6th of June and we scored it for the end of flowering at the end of August. So you can see that then if we come into something that's say a red here for say Hola 559, for, from the 29th of April sowing, say so started flowering about the 20th of August and scored it for flowering around that 27th of September roughly. So the flowering windows, and what we can see firstly is the huge difference between even spring varieties. So diamond flowered after 67 days on the 6th of June from the 31st of March sowing. Archer was exactly twice as many days later, so flowered after 134 days on the 12th of August. So a really big difference in our spring varieties when they get to flowering. What that meant, the diamond just didn't set up enough yield potential and also got hit pretty hard with sclerotinia. It was about 20% sclerotinia despite Prasaro being put out here, here, here and here. So we tried to not get it, but flowering too early just really exposed the crop to Prasaro, to um, sclerotinia. So diamond there, as we sowed it early, flowered on the 6th of June, but as we held back sowing by only about a fortnight, we were able to hold back flowering until early August. So, so it's certainly much safer flowering window. You can see for Wagga that that's much more your target flowering window. So it's a variety not to push too early in the window. But if you get a variety like Archer, we get a much tighter flowering window. So although in diamond we had um, about nine weeks difference in its time to start flowering between the sowing dates, Archer was only about two and a half weeks. So much more much more easy to target a certain flowering window with Archer across a range of sowing dates. So if, if there's a variety like Archer and maybe to a lesser extent a variety like Hyla 600 and maybe even GT50, if you've got that seed on hand, you can actually, you can be reasonably confident that you can make use of a sowing opportunity anywhere from say early April to late April where with Diamond you've got to be more likely to hold back sowing and not, not a variety you actually whack in sort of before that say 20th of April. And just to try to explain the differences in those varieties, we've, we've identified sort of three main canola phenology types. There's your winter types like Hyla 970 and Edimax. So this is roughly, say, when they might actually initiate buds. If it, that's the range of scenarios, and that's just a, this is just a hypothetical fitted line through a range of scenarios. So you can see as we, with the winter types such as Hyla 970 and Edimax, you can keep on giving them more thermal time and if they don't get 12 vernalisation days, 12 vern days, they just won't initiate a bud. So you can sow them in September and you obviously see that and they get plenty of temperature over summer. But until they get that vern time, which, which is 12 days, they will not initiate a bud. And then once they do get a bit more vern, they can still, they can still keep on going faster, but it's roughly that 12 vern days to actually initiate a bud and then run up, eventually start flowering. On the opposite extreme is something that's just completely spring. So we've got varieties like Diamond, Hyla 575, even 45YD8, although the difference in their, um, in how much absolute temperature is required, they have a very flat requirement. So, so say Diamond might be here and Hyla 575 might be a line across here and 45YD8 might be a line across here. But they hit a certain thermal time amount and they initiate buds. They're not affected by the amount of vernalization they get. But we get a lot of varieties in this window, in a facultative type window, that if you sow them early enough, in say early April, they don't get a lot of vernalisation in that period. So they do slow down a little. So if they're only getting sort of one or two vern days in that early period, they take more actual thermal time to hit initiation. So there's a lot of varieties like that, which you might not even think have a little bit of vernalisation, but even Stingray is a variety that's quite quick that does slow down slightly from, just it's got a slight vernalisation response that slows slightly compared to Diamond from an early sowing. Then varieties, you can come back to things like um, probably a lot, say the GT50s and even 44YD9 is one that, so you can see it does hold back a little bit from that early sowing. So that facultative in, in the springs is really useful for being a variety that you can sow a bit earlier so that you're not... So it's not going to race ahead into flowering. And so how did that match up with the flowering windows? So from 2002, 
to 2015 at Wagga. We'd, so with the fast varieties from IH30 to Stingray to Diamond, we only hit that flowering window from the later sowing date. With the mid varieties sort of all the way through from say Y89 or early mids up right up through to Highway 725, we're able to hit that window from the from the middle of April sowing. But then the uh, then the ones sown early is probably more in these longer type varieties. And you can see a couple of varieties that we've got a bit of flexibility that you can get say the Highway the 725 and the Highway 600 sort of hitting that flowering window across a couple of sowing dates. Whereas Archer being a bit longer, the later sowings of a lot of these varieties were just too late. But we get a softer environment, so that the actual average from 1966 to 2000, we get a, a wider window. But you can see these quick varieties sown even in the middle of April are just too early even for that. So exposing them to more frost, less radiation and potentially more disease. We can see some of these longer varieties such as Archer and Hyola 725 and even Hyola 600, they've hit that flowering window from every sowing date. So they're much more flexible in what they can, in, the, in their sowing date. And just looking at the trial Birchip did last year at Longrenong, that was fairly similar, I suppose, where we had diamond sown there on the 4th of April. This is just the commencement of flowering. So flowering there about the middle of June, but held back much later as we started flowering. But Archer didn't start flowering until late August from that, from that early April sowing. And everything sort of ranked fairly similarly in between. So I think it's all about, if you think about a... If you think about yourself going on a holiday, you want to know when you want to be on the holiday. When is the best time to go on the holiday? You need to work out how you're going to get there and when you're going to leave to get there. So if you think of a variety like diamond, it goes very quick. So you've got to sow it at exactly the right time to get there at the right time. Whereas if you, if you sow a variety like diamond that's very fast, too early, it just gets there too early and it doesn't set the yield potential and it gets hit by sclerotinia. Whereas if you hold back and get a slower variety, take the boat, say, and so that fairly early, you can hit the flowering window. But if you miss that first boat or miss that first sowing opportunity, the second boat gets faster because it, it vernalises faster and you can still hit that right flowering window. So those longer type varieties with a bit of vernalisation response just give a bit more flexibility to the system. But as you see as we go through, they're not, those longer type varieties are probably the most consistent across sowing dates, but not necessarily the highest yielding in a trial. So at Wagga last year, we had... From the early sowing there, the 31st of March, the highest yielding mostly from those longer season varieties. This is all ranked in phenology, so from diamond as the fastest at the top down to archer at the bottom. You can see all those green lights that are at the bottom in the slow varieties. But then as we start to delay sowing, you see some of those, you see the differences start to come through. You see those long varieties down at the bottom still being in the greens, but you see some of the quicker ones starting, more greens coming up higher. And then as we go along, diamond was the highest yielding variety overall in that trial, so 4.8 tonne. But we've got varieties such as GT50 and Hyla 600, which sort of hit it, had a much tighter flowering window and were very easily consistent in the yield across sowing dates, whereas Diamond was, was whacked earlier on, but yielded quite well from the later sowing date. And Longer and Long was a fairly similar response. You again see a variety like GT50, very consistent across the sowing dates, um, and even 45 YD8 there, um, whereas Diamond lower yielding from the early sowing, but picked up with its yield from the later sowing. So it's just really matching those varieties to those sowing dates. So we've, we've seen diamond has been a bit of a phenomenon. It, it, it topped the trials. You can see here, Lamaru was a highest yielding treatment. So it, at all our southern sites, diamond was the highest yielding, but it, had, it was only usually from one sowing date. It, wasn't a, it was the highest yielding individual treatment, but often wasn't the highest yielding variety across the whole trial, across all sowing dates. Uh, you see at Lamaru, it's similar sort of trends. So Diamond and Stingray and sown early had reduced yield, then had their highest yield more so from, say, that late April sowing. Whereas you've got, again, those varieties like Archer yielding highest from the early sowing. But everything dropped off there, which is a little bit surprising in a good finish there last year. They still all declined in yield fairly quickly at the end. But I suppose if you get all that right, nitrogen that I've... Especially in the zone that we're in is still the limiting factor. We've just... We're going into paddocks this year. A lot of canola are going into waterlogged paddocks from last year, and they're probably sitting on 40 kilos of available N. So if we're going to need to make up, if you're still targeting two and a half tonne of the hectare of, um, of canola yield, there's 160 kilos of nitrogen roughly that needs to be supplied to that crop. So through the combination of mineralisation, where we might be only going, getting, say, 40 kilos of mineralisation, there's still 120 of N to put in. So the inputs that are going to be required to sort of target a reasonable yield potential are going to be quite big. So 
we just ran a couple of little indicator trials there last year just to look at the response at, at each of our site. So again, Maine had a fairly, fairly wet site, started at 1.6 tonne of the hectare from when we started at 126 kilos of N and went up to 3.6 tonne, 3.7 tonne of the hectare when we put on 300 kilos of N. So economic responses at each 100 kilos of N that was put in. Finley a fairly similar trend, but consistently we still see this oil reduction as we, as we put more nitrogen onto the crop. And that's been pretty consistent across the trials we've done, 2012, 2013, 2014. Won't go into too much detail, but you can see the trends are either upwards till they flatten out. But I haven't actually done a dry land trial where, where it ever really tips over. We do consistently, so, so we haven't seen canola hay off, though we do consistently, as we increase nitrogen availability to the crop, we do consistently get oil declines, and that's, that's quite consistent. But across those trials we did there, about 0.25 tonne of the hectare yield gain equaled about a 1% oil reduction. So a two tonne of the hectare, $125 hectare gain from nitrogen was offset by an $18 loss from nitrogen. So it's just something to factor in. So we tried to see if we could hay canola off and we went up to 1,000 in some of those trials this year, but it didn't come up. So that was the, um, the little green bits of Cape weed, it was quite happy. Um, the other aspect really is if we get nitrogen right, we get sowing date and everything right, that extra water in the profile really makes a big difference too. So at Con Condobolin in 2015, so this is a much drier season, went into a loosened paddock with plenty of N. We added a little bit of, ex little bit of extra water to the system, so it was about an extra 20 mils. But that extra 20 mils when we sowed early gave about 700, nearly 700 kilos of extra grain yield just from an extra 20 mils of stored water. So a marginal water insufficiency of over 30 kilos per hectare. But there was no benefit of that extra water when we delayed sowing. So that had to be a combination of getting sowing date right, plenty of nitrogen, and, and a bit of stored water to actually drive that yield potential. And I know you guys had a good year with pulses last year, and they just seem to be primed to me to be canola paddocks for this year. They're probably going to have a bit of extra water, a little bit of extra nitrogen, but they go, yeah, so they're going to drive good canola potential in 2017. If you're not growing lentils on them again, that is. Um, be a bit of temptation there. So I think the other part, we, we don't do a lot of research on sulphur because there's been a lot of trials done in New South Wales and had very little response, but I thought it was interesting just to look at how much sulphur is in our trial sites. So across a, a range of different sites, a range of different soil types, you can see we range from about 102, a few in the hundreds here, most of them are sort of on um, more slightly granity sort of soil types where there's a bit less sulphur. But as we get out on sort of the more riverine, riverina type plains type country, you can see most of these sort of soils are in the threes, um, there's a fair few in the 300 range there, and then getting up into soils, like these thousands here are just what I'd call a chromosome type soil, they're not they're not heavy top soils or anything, they're fairly standard sort of duplex top soils for the Riverina, but there's a lot of sulphur underneath them. And then one where we got to a vertisol, about 25 tonne of the hectare of sulphur underneath it. Um, and if we actually looked at that and broke that up into the segments, if you went, if an agronomist went out to Cond our Condobolin site in 2016 and tested that to 0 to 60 centimetres, you'd say you got 48 kilos of, of sulphur in the soil. So you probably think, oh, I better whack a bit on. But if I tested that to 180 centimetres, we got 1,645 kilos a hectare of available sulphur because there was such a bank down in this range here below 60 centimetres. So I think it's a big message. If you're, if you're unsure about your sulphur decisions, then you really need to test the whole depth of the root zone to, to make a decision on that. So overall, we've... This is just from a few trials last year, but it has been fairly consistent. When we look at, say, the... the the relationships between flowering biomass and post-flowering biomass, there's, it's a bit of a shotgun approach to actually what the relationship between flowering biomass and yield is. But post-flowering growth, we have a fairly strong relationship with, with grain yield. So overall, we're finding that maturity biomass correlates fairly well with grain yield, although there are varieties that are, that are at slightly different levels. So we see something like diamond that seems to be able to consistently grow reasonable biomass, but has a really good harvest index. So at Wagga last year, it was about 0.34 harvest index, which is quite high. Something like stingray, so diamond might be up here, sort of middle of the road for biomass, but sitting up above that line for grain yield in this. Stingray is probably much lower for biomass, but again, very high up for its conversion of biomass into grain. Whereas it's got varieties probably like Hyla 600, which probably grow a little bit more biomass but don't quite convert all that into grain. And 45 YDA is another one that it's often held back a little bit on, um, on the harvest index. So moving forward to 2017, we'll have a big focus on that um, 
on that timing of biomass accumulation, so more biomass measurements, so say at um, floral initiation and then end of flowering as well to get to really hone in on, on those critical periods of biomass accumulation and then that conversion into grain yield. So looking at nitrogen, sowing date and phenology and variety in terms of say the hybrid, hybridity versus OP and TT. So they're the three main areas we'll focus on. So all in all, I think last year we saw those mid to late flowering varieties could be saying of a fairly broad window but they flowered in a much tighter window and had quite consistent yield, but weren't quite as high yielding as sort of the early to early mid varieties sown on their specific sowing date, where those early to early mid varieties did suffer yield penance for being sown too early. So, and that was, that was due to abiotic effects, just actually not capturing enough carbon. They weren't necessarily frosted last year, but, um, but also exposed to more disease, both sclerotinia and upper canopy blackleg. So yeah, more of a focus on that biomass accumulation in 2017. And really the, the messages for a lot of our guys is just in Southern New South Wales is to get more nitrogen in the system or to get canola, plant canola in, into the rotation to get it onto paddocks that have got more nitrogen in them. And that's, that's becoming much more of a, um, a common thing to get canola after a, after a legume crop to actually maximise its yield potential because it's hard to throw enough nitrogen at it to get the yield potential out of it. So there's a lot of workers in this and um, you can see we do use this irrigation to, to get things going on time to create a set of circumstances that can help you make decisions when an early break happens. So, um, so, so it's a fairly laborious job, but um, yeah, fair bit of thanks to them as well. So thank you, Keith.